In the dozens of videos that I've made about pattern plywood, one question has been in the comments over and over again. What happens when you turn it on the lathe? Now, up until this point, I haven't had a lathe in this shop, but recently, when I rebuilt my miter station, I included this flip-up lathe, which means that now it's time to test out the pattern plywood. I am new to turning, and from what I've heard, turning plywood is pretty challenging. I did spend a week with my friend Anne of All Trades, and she taught me a whole bunch of stuff. It's not cutting. I'm going to raise this up instead of stopping my lathe and raising my tool rest. Oh, uh, yeah. Stuff too. I'm still a novice, but I think I'm ready to tackle pattern plywood. So that's what we're doing this week. I'm going to glue up a bunch of blanks, and we're going to finally see what happens when you turn pattern plywood on the lathe. I'm testing out a whole bunch of new things in this project, one of which is these uh, new veneers. These come from Roar Rocket. They are beautifully dyed, and they're actually designed for making your own custom skateboards. But in this case, I'm gonna glue them to some panels, and I'm gonna use them to enhance the pattern of the pattern plywood. So I not only chose these veneers because they are amazing colors, I also picked them because they're a lot thicker than the other veneer that I was using. This veneer is a sixteenth of an inch and the other stuff that I used to use was less than a thirty second, so it's going to show up a lot better. I cut these in half and cut the panels down to half the size so I can line both sides of each panel with each color. I build like a sandwich out of all these panels and this is gonna make for a really easy glue up because I can just glue all the panels together at the same time. With a bit of wax paper over the top of a backer board, I then can lay on the veneer and on top of that one of the panels. I cover that panel with a whole bunch of wood glue, spreading it out with a glue spreader to make sure it's even. And then I could glue the bottom veneer on. I flip that panel over, add a glue to the other surface, and then add another veneer. I repeat that process until all four panels are glued up. The sandwich got topped off with another backer panel, and then I found every clamp I could in the shop and clamped this thing up and let it dry overnight. So we've been deciding between these two patterns. This is the woven hexagons pattern and this is the art deco pattern. And uh, I really, I was actually leaning towards this until I added this colored tape. I taped out where the veneer is gonna end up and this tape isn't perfect. It's, it's a little bit wider than the veneer and it's also not quite the right colors, but it definitely gave me an idea of how these are gonna look. And I think the art deco pattern looks a lot better. It's more like, visually digestible than this one. I think this one's gonna get kind of confusing and this is gonna look really cool wrapped around a cylinder. So um, this is what I'm gonna go with. Let's start ripping strips and gluing things up. Now I have a whole video on how to make hexagon based pattern plywood and that's basically what I'm doing here. I'm matching this 60 degree angle and uh, ripping it into strips. It's a surprisingly easy process but I can de I describe it better in that video so I don't wanna go too deep down that rabbit hole. The main thing is just checking to make sure that your angles are correct. I usually like to do a sacrificial piece, cut it into thirds and if they fit together, then I can start ripping up all the pieces. 
Now the deco pattern gets a couple of triangles that uh, I'll address later, but you can see I'm reserving parts of these panels to use for that application. I legitimately had to go back and rewatch my old video in order to remember how I made this jig. Essentially, you just cut a strip of plywood on that same angle, tape it to the fence, and butt it up against the blade, and that provides a rest so you can make these triangles that complete the pattern. Now that I have all of these components, it's time to glue them together. And for that, I'm going to use tape. The tape not only helps me organize them before they're glued, it also helps me clamp them once they are glued up. I wrap the tape all the way around all of the logs. And once they're together, I then cut them apart again and add glue. One thing that's a little bit of a challenge with these is trying to get the right amount of glue inside of them. If there's too much glue, it's gonna take a lot of pressure to get the glue to squeeze out. And if there's too little glue, you end up with gaps. It takes me a bit of practice. And when I haven't done it for a while, it takes me some time to figure out exactly the right amount. So not every one of them is perfect, but they're pretty darn good. I also really enjoyed that the glue squeeze out was the same color as the veneer. I recently upgraded my workbench with these vices and it is great. In this case, I used it for a sanding panel so it could sand off all that glue squeeze out that was on each of the logs. Okay, so what just happened was that I discovered that I can actually make this into a, a block if I use the little scrap pieces that I thought I wasn't able to use uh, that were leftovers from, from the panels that I cut. This is awesome because I can then like take this pattern and slice it up this way. Ooh, all right, that's gonna fall apart. Um, <laughs> take the pattern and then slice it up and uh, and I'm just gonna yield a lot more. I think one thing that I'm gonna have to do is tape these together. I got a couple of them taped. They, they seem to hold together a little bit better that way. And then I can, I can figure out some method for the glue up. This was honestly incredibly exciting because I didn't think that I was gonna yield nearly as much. I only had so much veneer and these little scrap pieces are all it took to almost like double the size of the pattern, at least add a third to it. One thing is that that piece that I cut into thirds before to test, I actually had to use for the scrap piece. So the outside yellow wasn't the best, but it was enough to get the glue up done. I could then flatten those after they dried and build a jig. So this is a totally new method for me of, of gluing up pattern plywood and I think it's kind of a game changer. In the past, I've cut everything into individual like tiles and then glued them up, but I'm starting to prefer the idea of just gluing a giant log up and then slicing that up like, you know, a deli would slice up salami. So I made two of these jigs, they're identical, and they got a little triangle at the bottom so I can rest the pattern up against that and stand it upright when it's done. After that, it was just a matter of gluing each individual strip in and making sure that they were nestled well between each color. I decided to stack the colors so you've got the CMYK in order, and you can see how much that extends the pattern by having these, these edges in there. Imagine if they weren't there, I would uh, have to slice away any of that excess. 
Once I've got all the pieces in there, I stood it up with both sides on there and then added some ratchet straps. I was hoping the ratchet straps would be enough pressure, but I ended up covering it with clamps as well because I wasn't getting the amount of squeeze out that I had hoped to. The clamps seemed to add a bit to it, but I still wasn't getting a ton of squeeze out and I just had to wait until the next day to see whether it all worked. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know about Foreo. They partnered with me to make this video and they are a Swedish beauty tech brand. Hang on a second, I know what you're thinking, but I'm talking about gift ideas. If your significant other likes to treat themselves, feel beautiful, go to the spa, but doesn't quite have the time, Foreo has some fantastic products. Specifically today, we're talking about the UFO2, which is an at-home supercharged facial device. This device offers benefits such as T-Sonic massage to relax muscle tension and boost radiance, and full-spectrum LED light therapy that diminishes the signs of aging and visibly revitalizes the skin. There's also a range of masks to go with it, providing the skin with immediate long-lasting hydration in two minutes. Ashley is a big fan of Foreo products. When I mentioned that they were sponsoring a video, she immediately asked what she'd be getting. So I know that she's gonna enjoy this gift. So if you're looking for a great gift for your significant other, I hope that you click the link down below. Check out the range of products that they have, especially the UFO2. So thanks Foreo, now back to the build. Well, it's, uh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's not perfect. I was hoping to get a perfect glue up. Um, the one side, the side that I glued up against is perfectly flat, which is great. That's what I need uh, when I book match this for the big turning. Uh, I, I can glue onto this face. This face is pretty chattery and there's a big gap. I, I think proof of concept is there. It does work. This is a cool way to glue up a big block. And I think if I did it another time, I could probably nail it, but I don't have any more veneer left. So this one's gonna have to work. Let's see what happens. So pretty much made as much pattern plywood out of those veneers as I could. And the nice thing is I had a little bit of extra, so it was enough to test out if I can cut thin veneers out of this. And uh, honestly, very successful. The hero of this is of course the new Harvey bandsaw, which uh, is a major upgrade from, from my previous bandsaw. It just allows me to get these beautifully straight resawed pieces. After that, I moved over the fence and cut a wider piece. This is gonna be used to test the lathe before I do the big turning. Then I divided the remainder of the block in half so that I could book match it and glue it up for a massive blank. <laughs> it looks so good, it looks so good. All those concerns that I had about the gaps seem to have gone away once you get to the center of it. I, I just cannot believe how good it looks in the center of this. I'm feeling a lot more confident about putting it on the lathe. Um, the veneers worked great. I just wanted to test this out so that the next time I can see, I mean, these are an eighth inch, so I can make these all day. We could cut a huge amount out of this block. This is just for future me so that I know, but these are for now me. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna glue this one together and I'm gonna turn this one on the lathe. God, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so excited. This is awesome. Okay. 
At this point, I have no idea how Pattern Plywood is gonna perform on a lathe, and so I decided rather than going for the big blank to start with a smaller one. If successful, this will be a new handle for my table saw. I drilled a hole in the blank and roughed up the sides of a bolt. I'm gonna be epoxying this in, so I cut off the head of the bolt with an angle grinder and mixed up some Total Boat high performance epoxy. Whoops, don't need that much. As I panicked <laughs> trying to figure out what to do with all the excess epoxy, I ended up just scraping it off into one of those Rockler glue trays, then let it sit overnight. The next morning, I trimmed off the corners to make the turning a little bit easier. I then threaded on a nut and a coupling, locking the two of them together, and this is just gonna extend the length of the handle so that it's easier to turn on the lathe and grip a little bit better. Also, it'll prevent me from damaging those threads. With the blank prepared, I can put it into the Novachuk, and I just tightened the jaws around that bolt. It worked great. This Novachuk is kind of like a multi-tool. You can use it for all sorts of different turnings, and you're gonna see me use it in a couple different ways throughout this video. Face mask on, it was time to start the turning, and <laughs> as soon as I got started, I swear I forgot everything that I knew and had been taught. I kind of futzed around trying to figure out the right angles to cut at. And it just takes a little while when you're learning a new craft to get your hands to do what your brain knows you should do. One thing looking back at this footage is that I a lot of the cuts that I'm making are pulling towards me and I'm not really sure why I was doing that. You'll see as I get more comfortable with this blank, I start pushing forward and cutting a lot deeper. And I think I just kind of found the bevel and it's really hard to describe until you actually have the tool in your hand and are cutting away material. Now you can see I'm getting the hang of it and it's moving a lot smoother. I'm more used to using the tool rest properly. It's just getting a lot easier to cut too. I think having it in round also makes a big difference and I started feeling more and more confident. Confidence, however, can uh, lead you to do some stupid things. And I thought that this thing could be unsupported uh, because it seemed so stable while I was turning it. Well, the instant I got a catch, the thing snapped, and fortunately, it was very easy to re-glue. So when I went back, I put the tailstock back up to it, and then I decided to use the skew chisel to get a little bit closer than I had before removing that tailstock. And to get the finish on the end of it, I just played it safe and used some sandpaper. I got one of these multi-roll sanding packs from Rockler and it's pretty awesome, especially for spindle turning. Uh, it's the like right size sandpaper and you can go through your grits really easily just tearing off what you need. There's this finishing technique that I've always wanted to try and I've seen loads of people do it, but you need a lathe in order to do it and it's, and it's best for spindle turnings like pins and stuff. So this is a CA glue finish. I used Starbond and I started with their thin finish and then filled in all the gaps with the thin. And from that point forward, I started using medium and built up nine layers of the medium on top of that thin and then polished it back with micro mesh pads. And it gives you this crazy shiny finish. Wow. Oh my God. Is insane. Look at the the glow. Look at how it changes. I'll post the tutorial that I, I took to, to do that finish. It was really impressive and I, I just can't believe how shiny I got it in such a short amount of time. After that I removed the lock nuts and tested the fit on the table saw.
All right, well, I learned quite a bit from this little handle turning. I, uh, I think I got a better grip on how to use the tools. And I also think I made some, some new decisions on how to use this block. One thing that I didn't like is that the blue didn't really show up that well on this. Most of it got turned away and that's gonna happen again when I try and turn this into a bowl. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these black ends off, glue them on top here and, uh, and then cut it into a bowl blank. So cut it into a circle and then pop it on the lathe. I think that's gonna make it easy and look a lot better. So let's get started on that. <laughs> I'm nervous, I've never turned a bowl and this seems like the worst way to learn, but we're gonna give it a go. It's funny, I feel like every time I work with pattern plywood, I learn something new and this time it's a lot about like saving and reusing materials and also just maximizing its yield because pattern plywood's time consuming and the veneers aren't necessarily inexpensive. They're about eight bucks a piece. And so I want it to use every bit of it in this turning. And the fact that I've gone from these hexagon shapes to almost a perfect cube is I think really impressive and and that totally changes the way that I think about making pattern plywood, especially for carvings and turnings. This is a, a very efficient way to build them. So after my experience truing up the handle, I decided to cut as much of the excess away from, from the blank as possible. So I didn't have to spend a bunch of time truing it up. I ended up with all these interesting shavings. If you got an idea of how to use them, please let me know in the comments down below. In order to get started on this bowl, I'm going to screw in this faceplate, which is going to allow me to get it onto the lathe. Now this will be the inside of the bowl, the side with the screws. So I'll turn away any of the thread marks and the holes from the screws. I got it set up on the lathe and pretty quickly moved to my larger tool rest. My small tool rest wasn't quite the right size. I got this larger tool rest from Rockler after talking with Ann about my last turning, which I kept having to move the tool rest back and forth. Also, you'll notice the confidence of the cut and how I'm pushing forward through the cut. It worked so much better and I got this smooth really quick. Ooh, I just sharpened it and it's so nice. Oh my God. Oh, that's so clean. Oh yes. Love the way that it's like it's like warping it like it pulls it into the vortex the gouge would cut really well as long as it was sharp and this plywood definitely made it dull pretty quick it was interesting i could actually use the heat from the tool to determine whether it was getting dull or not i mean you could tell that the cut wasn't going as well but sometimes you you know, start pushing a little bit harder so it, in my hand that was supporting the cut i could just feel the heat start to transfer through the metal and that let me know that it was time to sharpen again I think this is where I'm gonna stop because I really like how these sides are looking right now. And if I go too deep, I'm gonna lose some of this effect. I love how it warps, wraps around. I put a little bit of a dip in here. So it's sort of, you can see it on the edge there. Just give it a little bit of something. Yeah, I really like that a lot. So I think I'm gonna put the tendon in the bottom and then I can flip it out around and do the scary bit of hollowing it out from the inside. Now here's where we're gonna use the Nova Chuck again, and you have two choices when it comes to supporting a bowl. You can either do a tenon or a mortise. The tenon sticks out, the mortise goes in. I decided to go with a mortise because I wanted to maximize the pattern plywood on the outside. If you go with a tenon, you have to shave away some material. 
to make the mortise, I tested a bunch of the different tools that I now have, and the carbide ones seem to work the best. This is the carbide gouge from Rockler, and it just cut really cleanly in that center section. It worked well all the way up until I got to my outside line, and then I needed something like the skew chisel to get inside of there. I need like a dovetail in there for the Novachuk to hold on to. So the Novachuk has like a big ringed gear on the inside of it. And so you can either expand that gear or contract it and it pulls the face plate in and out. So depending on what you attach to it, you can either expand into a mortise or contract onto a tenon. With the bowl removed from the lathe, I can take off the face plate and then put it back on the lathe in the opposite direction. Now I have access to hollow out the inside. And again, when I turned the lathe on, I was back to not really knowing what I was doing. I, I didn't know how to place my hands. I didn't know how to engage the gouge, uh, but I just experimented until it started working. I watched dozens of videos and I've talked to a number of bolt turners, but again, once until it's in my hands, it was really hard to know how it felt. And in comparison to turning the outside, the inside was much more difficult. It was just a lot of material to remove and it was dense and it took a lot of time to get through all of it. I really wanted to learn how to use the bowl gouge. So I stuck with the bowl gouge for the majority of this, but I, I did end up having to switch in the end. It's, uh, it took a lot of sharpening. I think I sharpened probably every 10 minutes or so, and I spent several hours doing this, but the effects and changes in the pattern made it incredibly worth it and really enjoyable. Ooh. Got through the pink. All right, making progress. About halfway through the pink, I got my first catch and I thought it broke the lathe, to be honest. Oh, I see. Just got pulled out of the chuck. After the catch, things started going a lot smoother and gradually I got deeper and deeper, revealing more and more of the pattern. One thing I did run into is that as I got deeper into the bowl, I had trouble getting the bowl gouge to cut. I think it has to do with my grind, but rather than regrind the, like do a double bevel on, on the tool, I decided instead to switch over to the carbide tool, which I, I knew would work. The carbide tool cut great. It actually probably did a lot better and quicker, no sharpening, but it didn't leave nearly as good of a finish as the bowl gouge. <laughs> I got really relaxed in the cutting process and things were going smooth until they weren't. Here's my French. I just blew out the bottom of this thing. Oh, no, that might be it. There's a lot of tear out back here. Maybe I can get a grip on it again. I'll give it another go. Well, that I was certain was the end of the bowl, but it actually turned out to be okay. I, I had enough meat left on the bottom of it to hold into the chuck, 
and uh, just took my time from that point forward. No aggressive cuts. I was determined though to get all the way down to the bottom of the pattern, all the way to the black layer. Ooh, yeah. It's so deep you can't even see in there. At this point, I was really at the edge of what my tool rest could do, but I saw the black pattern and I wanted to, to finish it off. This was actually a cool process because every time I stopped the lathe, the pattern changed and I just chose to finish when I was happy with the way the pattern looked. That's it. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. So I know everybody wants to see the final shots of the bowl and we're getting to that, but I have a really exciting announcement. This is something that I've been working on for the last three years. I've been working with my buddy Akil to figure out a way that we can provide pattern plywood to you. You may have taken a poll recently asking what your favorite pattern of pattern plywood is and what size you could use in your shop. I get emails all the time, people saying, I would like to use pattern plywood in a project, but I just don't have the tools or I don't have the space or the time or access to the materials. And so I've made these available for pre-sale now. These are eight and a half by 11 by half an inch thick. And we have four different patterns. They are sanded up, ready to go. They don't have any finish on them. So they're not quite as shiny, but you can still see when they are shined up, how much the pattern is gonna come through. I am so excited about this. We even were able to get the dragon scale and it is flawless. I cannot wait to see what you guys make with this. So cool. So allinfab.com, go check it out. Sign up for the pre-sale. order yourself some panels that you use in your projects. And thank you for watching. I'm gonna to get to the final shots. Thank you to Ferreo for sponsoring this video. And thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you in the next one.